All right, hey everyone. Thanks for coming to this advanced topic lecture. Um, we're going to start by talking a little bit about homework six and mini project three because there's been complaints on Piazza, reasonably so, uh, in my opinion. Um, so, so the so for those of you that don't check Piazza, the core of the issue is there's a schedule overlap, right, between the homework six due and the mini project three due, which is not great because we're asking you to finish homework six in essentially three or four days and then start on project three. Um, and that's you know just go for the final. So that's the core of the issue. So what we're gonna do is um, hold on, let me turn off my notifications. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make homework six a pair project, uh, pair assignment. And so that means you can submit one homework six submission for the two of you. We're not gonna do four because there's not that much work for four. But if you want, you can submit a homework six as pairs, right? Um, so that should hopefully alleviate some uh, workload. Obviously, if you want to finish homework six alone, that's totally fine too, but you, at least you have the option of working in pairs. Um, I realize this might be kind of challenging if you don't like your current team, like the project teams that you've been working with before, or if your team is like three people, right? That gets a little awkward. Um, so, but you're all adults, so please just kind of work with everyone work with each other to find pairs to work with, work with. I've also not announced this on Piazza yet, so you're the first to hear it here, um, but I'm gonna go sit down and put that on Piazza now. I'm also gonna make a Piazza, uh, Piazza post just so that students can find pairs to work in, um, because I, there were even some like Project 2 people who weren't in Teams yet. So if you need a partner for Homework 6, please post it on Piazza, just so say, hey, I'm available, so that uh, people have a chance to find each other and uh, have a chance to find pairs, okay? So again, homework six is now a pair assignment, um, entirely optional. You can do it by yourself if you want, but because you are like implementing the Turby and forward backward from scratch, we thought, okay, like there's some room to um, make it a pair assignment. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is we've cut project three down by about 30%. So we've taken off quite a bit of work, coding work from project three. Um, I also don't think it was that, um, nutritional, I guess, like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that like great of a, it was like 20 points for quite a bit of work, like compared to the other parts of the project. So anyways, so the TAs and I, we've discussed it extensively. We've cut, essentially it was a, it's a hit a Markov model project to generate like Shakespearean poems, right? But there was like 20 points for like implementing an RNN LSTM with like very little guidance. So I was like, okay, that's kind of unreasonable amount of work. We're gonna take it off. So again, part one, homework six is now a pair project, and then project two, uh, project three, um, we're taking away the RNN LSTM, moving that into extra credit um, so that you don't have to do it. Okay, so hopefully that alleviates some of the volume of work concerns. Um, I'll announce it on Piazza officially in about five minutes. Um, any questions on homework six and project three? Yeah? Uh, could you guys release the probability Recitation. recitation. When is that recitation? Did that happen it, already? It happened already. It was on the Monday. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. It should be on there. Okay. Uh, that's. I think Emil gave that recitation. So I'll follow up. I'll, I'll make sure that goes up today. Thanks for thanks for letting me know. Yeah. Did that happen yesterday? Yeah. That one's up? That one's up? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I'll make sure both of those gets on there. Uh, yes? So three, No, it's just HMM. Yeah, you don't have to use a transformer for that. In fact, so I think for extra credit, we're gonna say you can either improve the HMM or you can implement an RNN LSTM um, or a transformer, but we didn't want to make that a requirement because there, in the project text, there wasn't enough guidance on like how to do that. It just said, do this for 20 points, and like there was nothing else. Um, so we just moved it into the extra credit section. Um, you'll, you'll see that when we release it over this weekend. And we'll try to release it a little bit. Uh, no, we'll really we'll release it on schedule. I almost said I was gonna release it early, but then you guys are gonna like jump on it instead of working on homework six, and it's gonna be awkward. So we'll just release it on schedule. Um, uh, I think it's currently scheduled to be 
released on Sunday. Yeah, on the fifth. So at least you'll have Saturday to kind of focus on Auburn Six and then you can divide up the work uh, going forward to uh, Project Three. Also for Project Three, if you have a group of three or four, uh, in fact, if you have a group of less than four students, I'm going to ask you to share that you're available on Piazza so that other students can join your team because. There's some, there's some teams that I guess like dissolve because some students dropped the course or like weren't available and such. So we're gonna try and reshuffle the teams around a little bit so everyone has a team to work with. There's, there's a couple students that are like working on Project 2 alone, and so that's not ideal. Okay, any other questions about Homework 6 and Project 3? All right, great. Okay, so then we'll move on to the okay, next topic. All right, hey everybody, it's good to see you again. Just as a reminder, I'm Lucas Mandrake. I'm the group supervisor of the Machine Learning and Instrument Autonomy Group at JPL. And it's my privilege to come and talk to you today about uh, explainability methods for machine learning. You hear this like it's a completely modern idea that we're just bringing to the field because people have figured out they need explanations. But actually, at the very beginning of the field, all the way back in the 80s when people were first starting to try to do this, it started with the idea that we need to understand what the models are learning. At the time, they thought we should do this with symbolic memory and symbolic understanding. Completely failed. That is not the right way to do it. But the field began there, and we kind of lost our way a little bit, and we're coming back to it now. In the modern application area, I would say that if you are not incorporating some kind of interpretability or explainability method or strategy in your project, you're probably not solving the right problem. So let's actually define that as you go forward here. So we're going to talk about what is an explanation and do I even want one? How do you know what they're for? The types of ML explanations we know how to provide so far, and there's always new ones coming out because it turns out that asking how did you do that has many different kinds of answers, even for a human. Um, we'll then talk specifically about model visualization, using surrogate models to approach this, and a few techniques for that. Uh, feature importance, which is the main workhorse of how we actually do this. There's a lot of ways to do that uh, with benefits beyond expl explainability. Um, we'll talk specifically about a very cutting edge one that's called SHAP that some of you have actually already played with um, in your homework. And then activation maps, which kind of have more promise than in the end they actually deliver. And finally, an improvement to those activation maps that's called This Looks Like That. And that's actually cutting edge research that's going on right now. Um, and I think it's probably the way forward of how to build it into the model from the beginning rather than just figure it out at the end. So I want to remind you just a little bit, this is my driving purpose of why I care about machine learning. I like advancing physical science using data science. And it's that last phrase, not only can we not assimilate it sensibly, but understand it. It's about understanding. It's not about automating things. But it turns out even if your goal was to automate something, you're going to need these methods anyway. But if you wanted to do it so you understand something, there's nothing but explanations at the end of the day. How did the model do that? Why did it do that? Ends up being your main deliverable, not an ROC curve. That is not enough. Um, so what, is an, what do I mean when I say an explanation? What do we mean when we say interpretability? And how do I know that I actually need one? And what I'm first going to introduce is I want you to imagine right now that we have the perfect black box. It is 100% accurate for with the application it was designed in. And it can tell you the correct answer every single time. For some applications, this is just fine. Weather prediction, I just want to know if it's going to rain. I actually don't care why. Or stock market prediction, you can wonder how it works all the way to the bank, right? You're, you are now rich. Species identification is fantastic, especially if it can say, I don't know what that species is. The biologists are immediately interested. They don't necessarily want to know why. And then safety systems, your car just needs to protect you. It doesn't necessarily need to justify its actions. So there are some applications where Perfect accuracy and automation is sufficient. And then there are some that are not. You have cancer. It might be accurate, but that's the beginning of the question, not the end, right? How, why do you say that? What kind of cancer? Where should I look? And what do I do when I go to the doctor other than say, I definitely have cancer, right? You need to know something else. Or your loan risk is too high, and immediately people are saying, how in the world did you decide that? I don't feel that's true. If you want to advance science, there's nothing but asking why. We predict things at first to prove that we're good at it, to justify the interpretations that we are testing by making the predictions. That's the point of science. And then what happens if our magic black box one day is only 99% accurate, and then it's 98% accurate, and you want to kind of get an idea of what's going on? Explainability methods end up being the same as debugging methods when you're in a data-driven environment. So 
whenever there's accountability, when you want to understand the causal factors of what's going on to erroneous behavior. And in, one of the takeaways that I want you to have from this is, it is very hard to find a positive message of the model succeeds because of this. It's much easier to find out that it fails for this reason. So debugging purposes always bubble to the top as why you want these. And your models will always fail at first and then eventually. And we'll be talking about that in the next lecture I get to talk with you about ML ops, where you can have a model that's, per, that's working amazingly today, but it probably won't be that way a month from now. And what do you do about that? Anytime you need user trust, appearing to be an oracle is a very dangerous situation, especially in high stakes, risk averse situations. And many explanations like science actually care more about the explanations than they do about the accuracy. The accuracy was how much they should trust your explanation. The explanation is not how much I should trust your accuracy. It goes the other way. And deep validation. I don't want you to tell me numerically on this particular test set how well you did. I actually know quite a lot about this field, and I know some of the ways that you should have learned how to do this. Tell me the, the general rules you're following, and I can, as an expert, nod and say, that is a reasonable thing you're doing. Or if they are totally alien to me, I don't trust this at all, and it probably learned completely the wrong reason. This is all statistical fluke that it even looks OK. Um, compliance, more and more data-driven systems are becoming enormously popular and used and, sus and very suspicious. They are, they are viewed skeptically. So compliance is a list of facts about them or constraints upon them that governmental regulation agencies are putting. And to defend yourself against those, you will need explanations as well. Um, performance improvement always. What's next? What's it missing? Why? Um, and then ethics is nothing but this. Characterize where it's going wrong. Are we, there will always be a bias. You will never be completely uniform in all possible ways. Have you characterized it well? And can you tell me why that's happening? And then finally, domain science is nothing but that. So one of the models we're going to talk about in more detail is that you have a black box model, and you have an explainer system sitting on top of it that's trying to give you insight. It doesn't have to be this way. This is kind of, the, I would almost call it the mistake that we made, because we moved so far away from it in the beginning that now we're coming back. That is one way to do it, but there are others as well. So let's talk about now the, these explanation, interpretation. Why do we have two words for this? And I'll warn you right now that literature is hilariously confused. No one is talking to each other and say, which do I really mean? They're just using whatever they want in their papers. It's almost arbitrary. But there are some consensus that are rising up in the better quality literature. But even today, you'll find people publishing across the board using these words as though they mean the same thing. And I don't even like how it's settled. I'll tell you the consensus now. And I think they got it wrong. But oh well, it's the consensus now. So one of the ideas that's emerging, and I'll show you two versions of it, is that interpretability is kind of like a notional simplicity. If I look at a model, does it fit in my head? And now I can think about it. A linear regression that functions because you have coefficients in front of these four variables, it fits in all of our heads. And so we feel like we can interpret how it works. The reason I don't like this is that Right now, I could ask you for an explanation, and people could judge that explanation. If I ask you for your interpretation, it's almost suggesting that other people will have different interpretations. That's exactly the opposite of how they're using it here. An, interpret an interpretable model is something we all agree on what it does. There's not different versions of it. So they kind of flipped it around. Um, however, if you don't have interpretability, then you need explainability. This is the first version of this definition that I'm going to expose you to. So interpretable models don't need explanations, and, in, and if black box models do and have to be added post facto. Um, and this, by the way, is how humans work. You really have no idea why your brain's doing what you're doing, why you pick up the object you have, why you turned left instead of right. Most of our consciousness is a post-process explaining to ourselves why we just did what we did. It's been proven in literature. It's fascinating to read. But we, our consciousness and sentience really is a post process explanation system, which is only marginally correct when it comes to introspection. So in some ways, we are thinking like we think when we do this on the system. But it isn't really the same thing as understanding, as psychology has discovered. Um, so because of this view, you're going to see kind of a, a model, as I'm showing on the right, where there's a whole bunch of models that are simple enough. They fit in our head. And we call those interpretable. And then there are a whole bunch that we absolutely guarantee don't fit in our heads, like gigantic deep neural net architectures. And so they, then we say, well, we need an explanatory system for these. Um, I'm not entirely a fan of this. I like the, the second version that I'm going to show you. And there are some really interesting corollaries that come out of this, too. One is 
interpretability by definition is now a function of your own intelligence and skills. So if it fits in your head, it's interpretable. If it fits in their head, it's not. I'm, I was trained as a physicist. I can, to some degree, think in Fourier space. So if it gives me an explanation in Fourier space, I'm like, what a wonderful interpretable model. Most people wouldn't say that. Um, so we can disagree and disagree. And that gets down to the features you're using, right? And this is a really important thing. The second part is that the emergent complexity of putting multiple systems together destroys interpretability no matter what. If I give you seven different linear regressions, all with different coefficients, different features, and say it's voting between all of these, good luck fitting that in your head and figuring out what the takeaway lesson was from this. So interpretability is brittle. It's easy to destroy as you build a system that is complex and skilled. Um, and again, so we'll leave this idea now. But an interpretable model can be understood by humans. An explainability method is what to do when you don't have an interpretation. That's version one. Version two, I'm going to suggest, is a little more powerful. And it actually says these are different axes, that you can have systems that are or are not either of them independently. We keep the definition of the first one. If it fits in your head and you can kind of figure out how the model's doing what it's doing. I didn't say why. If you can figure out how the model's doing it, we call it interpretable. But, and you can say, how did the model do that? Which features matter? What, how are the features combined? What are the decisional thresholds? If you can answer those questions, you can pretty much reason how the model did what it did. Explainability talks about the justification. This is different. So this is now about why did your model do that and why did your data tell your model to do that? It gets deeper into the why did this happen? Um, and this actually gets now down to rationales, takeaway messages. What do I need to know about this data or this problem that caused this outcome to happen? So some ML models are interpretable. Few, I would actually argue almost no ML models are inherently explainable. They make predictions. They don't tell you how, wh why. Um, and the less interpretable a model is, the harder it is to explain. That's true. You have to work farther to go. But even a linear regression, do you really know why the coefficients are the way they are? You would have to go back to the data to figure it out. So it's actually even a linear regression, I would argue, isn't an explainable system by itself. It doesn't give you an explanation. So you get something that kind of looks like this. And bear with me. I put those blue things. This is not codified in the literature. I just put those blue things down to suggest. But like human reflexes, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen and the reasoning of why it happens like that. If I put fire next to your skin, you're going to jump. There is no explanation offered to you. It's simply a reflex. It happens. No one in the room is confused how it happened. We can measure the thresholds. We can measure all the nerves and how they're connected together. Perfectly reproducible, understandable. But the why involves the entire evolutionary history of your biology. That's an explanation your body is not providing you. On exactly the opposite end, we have human preference justification. Why do you like that dish? I tend to like dishes that are salty, and that one feels too heavy for me, so I don't like it. I prefer this one. OK, well, that is an excellent explanation. I actually learned something about you rules of preferences that I can now apply. How did your brain decide that? I don't know, right? So this is a system that is totally uninterpretable, but is explainable. It's producing them. And you can mix them up. Human card games have both. You know the full rules of the game. You know the points and how they go together and how you should play it. It's all written out in front of you. And then at the very bottom, there's human intuition. This is the answer. I don't know how my brain did it. I don't know why I know it's true either. But it seems to be sometimes, right? And there are cases where you have that. Um, you always see, you know, they scatter different kinds of, of models on this graph somewhere. And I tried to put it into this two-dimensional space. But for the most part, it doesn't really get very far in the explainable system. ML doesn't really do that for you. And there's an idea that there's these XAI methods that I'll expose you to that is all the way out on the right to help you understand. Um, that's mostly what I'm, what I'm going to say about there, except for the fact that I put some things on here that aren't models. Feature engineering. Anytime you stop and capture your knowledge, and make it into a simpler feature that answers a question or adds something to your problem, you are making it immediately more interpretable. You're just moving it in that direction. People get what's going on. They can understand it better. And you're helping explainability, too. So it's just a good idea. Now, I actually wanted to ask you a question to reason about for a little bit. On that graph, where do you think scientific theory goes? F equals MA, Maxwell's equations, all of that. Are they explainable? Are they interpretable? What are they? What are your thoughts? I'd say it would be medium to high on like the interpretability, depending on how complex it is, but not very explainable because you don't know why. I guess you know 
why specific theories are the way they are, in the sense that you can conceive of different universes that would have had slightly different fundamental functions, but it could actually be very different. We don't know why this one is different. So high interpretability, medium on the explainability? More like low, medium on the explainability. Interesting perspective. Other thoughts? And in fact, let's break it into two. Statistical theories like quantum mechanics and mechanical theories like Newton, you know, Newton's laws, very different objects. I would say that, and see if you agree, statistical theories are highly interpretable to make their calculations, but they offer you no explanation of actually how it got there. Why did the particle get from here to there? There is no, in fact, quantum mechanics says there is no explanation. You will never have an explanation. There is only a statistical interpretation of what's going on, which allows you to compute, but not to understand. So I would, I would argue that. But I think in some of what you just said, there are differences of opinion here. Some people would say that mathematical descriptions of the force of nature are the ultimate explanations. Right? They completely capture as much as you can a why. And I would say those people see understanding as prediction, if it predicts fully. But then there are other people saying, yes, but why in our universe are they that way? And they're looking for something deeper. I think in, if you if you do classify like highly mathematical theories, like, oh, like let's say something like classical mechanics, which you, know, you can quant you can quantify, and you have principles that tell you how why a trajectory is the way it is. I still would not say that's explainable because it, at least in this in the machine learning context, it seems you're asking why did the model do what it did. So in this case, you'd ask why did this why did the theory come up? I think that's the level at which I would like translate the question as opposed to why did the particle. There definitely is not one correct answer here. I think these are very reasoned answers that I'm hearing. And I, I amused myself for quite a while deciding if I could put a dot on the graph. And it's down here because I didn't. Um, and there's different kinds. of. But now what if we take those, model, take those math models and we put them into a computational model, an actual model you would run to predict the weather, to predict the outcome of an experiment. At first, it appears to be in a highly interpretable model because you've literally written down exactly what it does. But almost immediately when you start bringing in the array sizes and how many things that you're trying to do in the compute, it becomes so complicated that actually it doesn't fit in your head at all. And it definitely isn't explainable either because it's making predictions and it doesn't suggest to you any at all. On Tuesdays, generally speaking, it rains here. That would be a whole other system that would take its output and tries to explain it. So this is back in the ML way. But thinking about the theory is kind of interesting too. Um, I'd love to keep talking with you more about that, but we should keep going. Um, also, I just wanted to expose this to you. If you do Google searches on explainability in ML, you're going to see things like this. And it makes me angry. For the first reason it makes me angry is there is this circle. Like, like we have explored some beautiful space, perfectly well sampled, right, of all the possible models. Complete crap. This one's much more accurate. You know, we have some models there. And then it is really true. And in fact, it should have linear regression on it. Linear regression, decision trees, and random forests are weirdly powerful and weirdly interpretable. And that's just a fact of reality. So if you see something like this, you immediately know that like a marketer got to it or something. But the second reason that makes me angry is that this is reality. For any one problem that you have, you hit some threshold where you just don't need bigger, more complex models. The performance just tapers off. And in fact, it tapers off based on the quality of your features. If you manage to go all the way up here, you probably are doing zero effort to make good features for your problems. You're just taking raw pixels, throwing them into deep learning, and saying, hope you figured that out. I didn't help you at all. Right? If you work with it and, and make engineered features that help you, you can start knocking this level down and saturate earlier at easier models. And when you do that, you're making everything after that easier. The interpretation becomes easier. The explanation becomes easier. So please, don't see this as progress. This means you haven't helped very much. You really should be helping a little bit more. Right? Give it. Give it, a, give it a break. Um, and then saying a model with more parameters, just to really drive it home, fit the training data better, is a tautology. Of course it did. What did you think was going to happen, right? Wouldn't it be horrible if it didn't? So that's not really a claim of anything. You should see it kind of going up, hit a knee, and then weakly go up, because what else would it do? This means nothing. And if you pick this one and say, well, that's the highest performance, you're not thinking, right? You're just taking the max of a graph. So really, like. You know, be careful when you say you need certain models. Um, 
All right, enough of that. So now let's get into kinds of interpretations and explanations. This is what we know how to do. So here's your average ML model sitting there happily, and let's say that it works very well. One thing you could say is, in order for it to function, which were the training examples that were most important to it? Understanding that the majority of your training data probably didn't do anything at all. I mean, wouldn't it be astounding if you actually needed every single training example evenly? That's less likely than that there are certain ones with more influence than others. So that's an interesting question. That gets really interesting when your model isn't working well because it probably is going back in your training data. Where else would it be? The second is feature importance. Which are the driving variables that are actually determining my explanations? This one is enormous. Um, I would actually call this the workhorse of the entire affair. And everything that we're doing kind of always tries to get back to this one because it is a general lesson you can take away. Feature sensitivity. This isn't the same thing as feature importance. If I tweak this, this feature a little bit, how much does it tweak my output? So this is a more nuanced. And in science, before ML came along, this is what scientists called feature importance. They would take a physical model. They would do a little parameter variation on the inputs, watch what happens on the outside, measure that sensitivity. And they would say, that's why it's important. So a little bit different. Surrogate models are, well, I used a black box, and I don't understand what it's doing. But maybe I can train a simpler model next to it that can give me some insight into it. And there's a few ways to do that. Activation maps, which sounded like a great idea. Deep learning people put stuff into neurons and then said, well, I can't understand anything. Can I go backwards? Can I start at the end, work backwards, and then show me regions that were most important in my image? It sounds like a great idea in its vanilla way. It's no more interpretable than you started with at the beginning. But there are some modern approaches that I think really add value. Glass box models. Don't use the black box model to begin with. Why not choose one that you can actually understand to begin with? Do walk away with that in your head, please. Um, and then finally, model visualization. Some models and some feature spaces, if you work on them hard enough, you can make plots where you can see the whole darn thing, or at least images into it. And if you can do that, humans have an amazing visual cortex that can fit very complex messages into us in an instant. So that's wonderful. I see a hand. Is it? Uh, yes and no. It's related to that, but sensitivity just talks about of the prediction that I made, how much did this feature really contribute to it? Uncertainty quantification includes there could be different sets of features entirely, and here's the certainty that I have that this feature is even included in the set. So there, uncertainty is a bigger question that includes the concepts of sensitivity and uncertainty itself. Does that answer your question? All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We are going to get into it. Okay. We are going to get into it in detail. Um, but bear with me. Let's knock a few things out really quickly first. So model visualization. This is a trivial. You can find infinite numbers of these on Google. People love to plot them, especially if they just wrote a library and they want to demonstrate the library to you. So this is a two-dimensional uh, input space, so just two features. Here's exactly all my training data. I trained a bunch of models on it. It's supposed to show you that the models actually work. But the visualization is actually quite beautiful because you are communicating to the human, this is the decision surface in a way that fits in your visual cortex. That's lovely. Will you ever be working in a two-dimensional space? Almost certainly not. Can't I use dimensionality reduction to get to the two-dimensional space? You absolutely can. But those two dimensions are now totally uninterpretable. So it didn't actually help you in any way. But it will make a beautiful graph that doesn't tell you anything. Um, but why this is useful is that if you can show that your, your model is dominated by a few features, plotting a few of these with those dominant features, just pair them together in different ways, still can communicate to the human a great deal of understanding. So this is an interpretability method, not an explainability method. But don't, don't short shrift it. There's a lot that can be gained here. And oftentimes, you'll see points way suddenly out there on that space. And you're like, oh, that's one of the problematic things of making the model not work. Um, Usually, and that was very model specific, right? That's only functions when the model can handle it and you can actually interpret it. Surrogate models. This one's a little more complicated. Um, so, and I want to introduce this in a slightly different way. You should always have a baseline model. That means you should never take your data, train a complex model, and say, look at this wonderful accuracy I got. Here you go. You should have a simpler model that does eh on it so that you can compare it to that and say, here's the, the advantages, the strengths and weaknesses of it. Because that other model probably is cheaper, faster, and more interpretable. And you want to actually explain to the person whether or not they need that better model. 
So you should always be sweeping your model complexity. It should just be part of your process. And that means as soon as you do that, you have a simpler baseline model that is probably explainable, or at least interpretable, and allows you some insight. And, how, and it can look in two different ways. And I really want to drive this home because people think of this as like a, yeah, yeah, whatever, I'll do that. But no, it's really important. One way to do it is you can have your input data come in, hit your complex model, it makes its complex output, and then you dump that into whatever interpretable model you're comfortable with. A linear regression is usually what I use, or a decision tree, and then, and then it has its approximate output. So it's trying to emulate that complex model. And you go, Luke, this sucks. It's like 60% accurate compared to that bigger model. What did you just say? 60% of your problem is linear and fully understandable, and you can explain it to someone with a simple equation. That is one of the most amazing findings an explainability method could have ever given you, and you did it just because you did this. So please, really consider doing these things. The second way that you can wire it up is a little more sophisticated. You can have your data come in and hit a linear model, and then the output of that is corrected by whatever complex model that you want. So this is a bias correction model. And now you can actually say, what percentage of your accuracy is coming from this, and then this tweak doesn't contain any of the physics that this is explaining. It contains the rest of the physics that this isn't explaining. And that's even more information to a scientist or whoever you're working toward, is that whatever this is fitting is not this, because I already pulled it out of the problem for you. So that's really powerful. And again, this is essentially free. So just do that. All right. Here's something that's a little more complicated. This is called the line method. By the way, there was like a Cambrian explosion from like 2016 to 2018 of explainability methods. As far as I can tell, there's all this creativity, and we've just been kind of riffing off of it since then. So I'm not exactly sure why, why it happened then and then why people got depressed or something. I don't know why it didn't keep going. Maybe that was just as many as they could find. This kind of explainability is only OK. I've actually never been on a project that needed this, but here's how it goes. So you have some really complex nonlinear decision space, arbitrarily complex in a high dimensional space. But if you zoom in on any one, ex one point and you want to say, why did you say what you did there? That surface is, of course, planar. Because zoom in on anything far enough and it's a linear surface. Or at least we hope so. And you can immediately say, what if the data the space isn't quite there and whatever. Let's assume it is. So let's just fit a linear model to that because now, or, or whatever you want, interpretability, decision tree, whatever. Because now I can, I can answer the question, let's vary all the features around there until I get different answers, train a model on that simple little distribution, and now I can pull out an explanation for this point. Yes, but what were the features that depended on the entire thing? Mm. I, this only works for like this one point. Is the sum of the explanation of why your whole model works just all the individual explanations? Uh, not really obvious, I don't know. So it works only in that way. It was kind of designed more for like economics and actuarials and things like that that needed to give, like somebody complained their loan application was denied and you need an explanation right now of why that's true. It's, it's good at that. It's not really good for the whole system understanding stuff. Um, and it is totally agnostic to, the, to the, uh, the entire model. You can put any black box model into this thing. It's not making approximations or assumptions. Um, however, I said you perturb in the feature space all around the point. What distribution should I use? Whatever you'd like. There's no real guidance on that. And that, tr that can really change your answer that you get out of it. So that's the art. That's the black box of the method that's supposed to give you explainability. So it has some serious issues. Now, if there are formal statisticians in the room, I apologize, because they're going to bristle and say, we have entire PhDs on what distribution you should use. But my response would be, if you need a PhD, to know the distribution. This isn't that great of a system if you're looking for an explanation. Um, so I'm not that impressed with it, but it's out there if that's what you want, local explanations. Um, but now let's really get to what you hear me uh, talk about passionately, feature importance. Which features matter most? This is easy. It's interpretable. It makes your model faster. It makes your model simpler. It makes it cheaper for later people to use. Please do this. Always do this. Um, and it also is an enormous part of explainability. Um, why you want this, if your feature importances kind of come out like this, that means you can arbitrarily speed up by a factor of two without any further work because you can throw half of them away. That's an enormous benefit, and it's more explainable and everything else like I just said. And it, essentially, it's another hyperparameter. Which features do I use is simply a mask that you are sweeping over when you're evaluating your model. Every ML framework has feature selection built into it in a variety of ways. We'll go into some of them. Do that you are automatically starting to get to understanding when you do this. 
And when you combine feature engineering into it, you can engineer your hypotheses of what's true in your data as a feature. If what I said is true, then this feature will be important. Test. It is not important. I'm wrong. You can set up an entire grid of these, do feature importance, and you're doing hypothesis testing in a data-driven way. So very nice stuff. But let's keep going. So why don't I just do this trivially, and why doesn't everybody just stop here? Because there's wrinkles. The first wrinkle is correlated inputs. Every, every data set you will work on actually has correlated features, no matter what you do. If it's science data, that's called physics, at least. The physics is there because there's correlations between it, unless it's perfectly optimally sampled to avoid that, which it never will be. So what happens when there's correlations is a very important question to ask of any method for feature importance that you use. How's it going to mess me up? What's it going to look like? And we'll go through them all. Um, in this, when, they, when the features are uncorrelated, you have adding the feature improves your performance by a certain amount, and removing it drops it by a certain amount. Everything's beautiful. It's very linear, very easy to understand. We all kind of want to think about it that way. If they're correlated, not true. You do not have a unique set of perfect features. You have potential sets of perfect features with replacements in them. We're not talking about just pairwise. You can say, why not just drop them? Why not get rid of them? Because multicollinearity is a thing. And so one, like three or four variables might contain all the information of one of the other features. Good luck finding that one on your correlation plot, staring at it and crossing your eyes. You'll never spot it, but your model will. So it will be affecting you. Um, it also means that your feature selection has essentially an uncertainty. Since there are different redundant answers that could be included, this feature is 30% likely to be important. But when it's there, it's this important. So this is what, what correlation can do to you. And the different methods respond differently. The second one is pairwise relationships as we go through it. Um, pairwise relationships are more complex, but they actually manifest in almost exactly the same way. So let's imagine, for instance, that I'm trying to predict disease and I measure your height. It has no predictive correlation whatsoever to it, but now I measure your height twice at different ages, and the delta between them is perfectly correlated with whether you have the disease or not because you're shrinking, and the humans shouldn't generally do this. So this is an example where a feature has zero skill, but a pair of features has skill. You can have threes and fours and fives that all contain that. The moment you realize you have these in your problem, you really should stop and try to engineer them out. Can we make a new feature that captures that relationship? Can I do a hypothesis test to show the importance of that four now goes down because I captured it in this one and then get rid of them? That's the ideal because you're actually capturing knowledge when you do that. You won't always be able to do that. So asking what your feature selection, uh, how it behaves and misbehaves when there's these pairwise relationships is an important question. And we'll go through all the different methods now. So let's start. And what we're going to start with now is model specific. And I'm going to say these are for free, because if you use these models, you just get to use them. And actually, Jake was just sharing with me that some of you had an unpleasant experience because one of the importance methods that a tree-based uh, classifier was using when you just said feature importance, and it didn't explain to you how it was doing it, was the frequency that it was contained in the tree. And that was a horrible one. It doesn't actually correlate with any kind of importance that we would care about. But these are better ones. Um, so these are ones that are a little, a little more well-preserved. So let's say that. Uh, well, the first one I want to show you because it's so easy is coefficients, right? You fit a curve to it, you look at the coefficients, and this is super powerful. It doesn't just tell you importance, it tells you magnitude, it tells you directionality as well. So that's a, that would be the difference between importance and sensitivity in this case, is that sensitivity includes the sign of how does your answer change. Importance would just say, does it matter or does it not as you remove it. Um, very powerful. It doesn't mean that your problem has to be linear because you, they, it's just a linear series of vectors, and the vectors themselves can be nonlinear features. So you can actually do all sorts of things if you allow yourself to get creative. Your engineered features don't need to be linear. They can be anything you want, and it can make your problem linear because you put the nonlinearity into your features. So very powerful. You should always have it in there. Also, you can trivially read out the importances as long as you're normalized. Pause, right? Normalization actually is incredible. I'm sure you've actually gone through it a little bit about the rights and wrong ways that you can normalize data. But you really do have to stop and say, oh my gosh, for my problem, what's the right way to normalize? Normalizing a spectra by a block of the whole intensities versus standardization versus uniform. There's a lot of choices there. If you get it wrong, you can't compare these. They won't be in the right units or right relationships with each other. Um, so the good thing, you get global and local explanations and interpretability. I can say, why did this point do what it did? And I can say, on average, for my whole problem, why is it true? The bad 
you can't really do this for more than 12 dimensions. You try to do a linear fit to something, and it actually will sag fault. It gets numerically unstable. The cursor dimensionality eats your lunch. It's over. So there are ridge regressions and things that kind of help with that a little bit, but it's still a problem. For correlation, and I want to just walk you through this because this is very common, you get an underestimation. I'm using this feature sometimes, and I'm using this feature sometimes, and they have similar information. And that means if I ask what either one and how important it is, you get kind of half what you should. That's like an ideal case. But that means now my most important feature was actually number three, because these other two features that were more important than it are, are fighting to get recognition. So it reduces your estimation of them. Pairwise, it handles beautifully if they are linearly related. Otherwise, it takes the linear projection of it and says, this is how they're related to each other, and adds it to the contribution. So it's hidden from you. It can handle it sometimes, and it does handle the linear port part of it, but it doesn't tell you it was there. All right. Decision trees. It's supposed to go through and very simply say, let's see all the different places I use this feature. Every time I use a feature, how much did I decrease the impurity in the split? Add all those up for your tree. That's the importance of the feature. Very direct and simple. And again, it's very fast to compute. It's for free. It already knows this when it did the tree for you, so you might as well ask. Um, the bad thing is that for features that have high cardinality, you know, that are integers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth, it has to just keep splitting and splitting and splitting on those. So then it, it likes to tell you this is super important. And what it's really just saying is there's lots of settings, whereas a binary feature gets deweighted for that. But otherwise, if your features are similar to each other, then it will give you a pretty good, um, a pretty good estimate of it. Uh, it, again, underestimates correlations, but it has horrible handling of pairwise relationships. If you give it two things and it was the difference between them that actually contain the information, imagine approximating subtracting two, uh, two values for all possible values with a decision tree. Right? That's a big, long tree, and it's horrible. So it's, it really sucks at that. Um, now, in a, dis in a random forest or a a boosted forest or whatever you want to do. It's just this put over all of them in average. So it's exactly the same thing, again, for free. And these, these have almost all the performance of a neural network. So this is now a very inter well, reasonably interpretable version of deep learning, as long as you put in useful features. It doesn't work on raw pixel values, but um, very powerful. All right, so those are the ones that were model specific. Now we'll talk about some agnostic ones. You probably already talked extensively about greedy forward why it's a terrible idea. You probably should never do it. But greedy forward just says, hey, all the features, I'm just going to test you. Whichever one made my model performance go up the most, that's the one I pick. Now let's do the next one. Now let's do the next one. And I just go all the way up. If I want the feature importance of everything, that's a lot of runs. You're training and, and, and evaluating n times n plus 1 over 2. Um, but usually much less, because you're usually actually saying, after 10, I can see my performance is already asymptoting, so I'm, I'm not going to bother to run all the rest of them. So this ends up being something very fast. But it really isn't very good. So pairwise, it completely misses and doesn't tell you they were there. It will never find them. It will select against them. You will always have multiple relationships inside your data. Cor but the, it actually does pretty well on the correlation. It will arbitrarily pick one of them, pick it, and ignore all the others as you go forward. Again, it doesn't tell you they were there, but at least it does something sensible. It doesn't actually report something wrong or tell you it, wasn't, it didn't matter. Here's the opposite version that has less problems and more compute. So start with all of them selected. Compare your model. Now remove one all the way through. Find the one that hurts you the least, and then go down to the next one. And keep doing that and keep doing that. But this one, if you want to get all the way to low, uh, low k, you have to go all the way down and do all of those n times n plus 1 over 2 runs. So this is computationally expensive, but it actually gives you a much better estimate going forward. It has some problems, but the good stuff first. Preserves pairwise relationship plus relationships perfectly, because they're already in there. And as soon as it tries to take one away, it blows up. So it knows not to do that. You can also kind of see they're there. You'll see your performance get hurt when it finally has to choose one of them to be removed. And then it doesn't really change at all when it gets rid of the other part of it, or the next few. So if you see those little mesas, it's like, ah, pairwise relationship. Let's go look at those features. And now you're ready to feature engineer it out. Um, super slow. Uh, it takes a lot of compute. Um, and then. This is a big one. When you have correlations in your data and there's kind of arbitrary things that it could do, it's making those decisions when the differences between things are essentially noise. In fact, most of the decisions of what to throw out are being made when the, mod the difference between throwing out features is having very little difference. So you could have hundreds of different trajectories that come out of here and end up with very different answers in a correlated case. And you won't know that. It's just going to pick one of them and be kind of arbitrary about it. 
So I actually sometimes, if I just have a large computer and I don't care about it, I will run this many, many times with kind of some noise on the data just to see the distribution that I get out of it. And that can be informative too. Um, and then lastly, this one, you're going to say, why don't you just always use this? So permutation. You train once. And then you just go in, and anytime you want to say, does this feature matter, you randomly permute its contents and you run your model at it and say, now how badly did it do? So instead of removing and retraining, you're just saying, did it hurt you when I do this? So super fast. The sad thing is, in the literature, this is usually used greedy forward. They go through and just, they do it once across the whole thing and say, that must be your feature importance. But in the presence of correlations, if you remove any one of those features, it doesn't hurt you at all. So almost all of your features could actually end up not showing any importance because there are other similar features nearby. So it is a gross underestimate when it tells you. What it's really asking is, which of the features are uniquely informative? And that's implied. Um, so just keep that in mind. And its application in the literature is much, much greater than the understanding of what it's actually solving. They treat this like it is feature importance black box. It also correctly assigns pairwise. You knock out one, men one membership of one of these and your performance does go down. And you knock out any of those and your performance goes down. So you can see little mesas. It will, it will tell you there. And it even almost gives you a little bit of a hint. So remember that, but it's not everything. All right, now let's take you all the way to the state of the art. And by that, I'm now taking you ahead like 15 years. So it's a very young field. There's a lot of things that are still changing. Um, this is called SHAP. And let me, let me just do a time check here. Yeah, good. Um, all right. This is borrowing from game theory, where there had already been a lot of work where they were talking about coalitions. There can be different players that work together in a coalition, all contributing to the greater whole. And we want to assign you, as game theorists love to do in their vicious way, exactly how much do I value your presence in my coalition. So you could imagine teams contributing on a homework assignment. Um, and so what you do, because you're a formal Bayesian statistician, is you say, well, let's take all possible sets of all possible players, and then let's separate out the ones that contained you and compare each of those to the ones that didn't contain you, and then take an average of the loss of performance when we, or improvement of the performance if it's adversarial, um, as, we change, as we remove you from the group, take the average over all of those, and that must be your utility of being present in the group. It's a very reasoned thing, but I just want to make a nuanced change here, because earlier I was saying sweep the feature space and find the most performant one, and then let's understand the features that are in that set. That's one question. They're saying, for all possible feature sets, how much value do you bring for all of them? So if your model needs 10 features, it's also asking, yeah, but if I only give you two, how much more do you add? And your model might just suck when there's only two going to three. It still might suck. So it's taking an average of like the right thing and a bunch of other stuff that I'm not sure if I care about. It's likely your data doesn't care. It's likely it would be kind of a pathological data set to make these be disparate sets. But it is a different question. So just keep that in mind. The reason they did that is it has really nice statistical properties. So there's a, there's a lot of support and game theory um, logic that suggests it will have additive properties and supported properties, things like this. And that comes later when we get to the explanations. But it is a different question. Feature importance here means your feature importance at any time to anyone ever. That's what it is. All right. Um, what it really comes down to is the average of marginal contributions when adding this feature to possible subsets, like I said. So think about what that means. We're now training your model to the power set of all possible sets of features. That's worse than the RFE that I just showed you a minute ago. This is, this is 2 to the n where n is the number of features, and it says, yes, you need to do all of those. But it's worse, because now you want to do that for every point in your data, too. For this prediction in your set, let's, make, let's see how much you added. Now, how much for this prediction? Now, how much for this prediction? And calculate those for all possible feature sets. And at the end, your global answer is the average over all of the instances that are in your data, too. So this is an insane amount of compute. I mean, it's, it's n times 2 to the n. Uh, sorry, it's, it's number of instances times um, 2 to the n. So craziness. Um, the properties of this thing. It has signed importance. It, can, it actually estimates how much do you help or hurt as in the adversarial case, which is kind of sad. Um, it's co computationally perverse. It, for correlations, it still has the same problem. It will reduce your apparent impact because someone else was pulling your weight for you. So it underestimates how much you help. 
It is explicitly handling pairwise, though. There's an extension of this where you can actually say how much do people uh, interact and correlate. But it is itself almost uninterpretable. So even though it gives you the information, it literally says in the literature, this is rarely interpretable, like as it's going through, because it's so hard to understand. And I'll show you exactly what it means. Um, because it's not computationally feasible, it almost always is approximated by sampling. Is there some way we can sample these sets? Can we sample the number of points in your distribution? Something can we do to make this a little more tenable? Um, all right, let's keep going on the SHAP. Um, so there's the local version that I said for all instances, for all feature sets, how much do you help? You average over it for the global answer at the end of it. And they come with custom plots. This thing was supposed to be the tour de force of feature importance. So it even came with the plots you're supposed to make woven into the library for you, which is kind of nice that they thought all the way to the end user. This one particular one's called a bee swarm plot. And all their plots have this character where they loaded in density of information maximally. So these are the features that might matter for you. This is the SHAP value that talks about how much this influences positively or negatively, whatever outcome that you're trying to predict. This is the feature value in colors and then the distribution plot. And this is just making sure there's not overplotting when it kind of bends up and down. So lots of points here. And this one is saying that when the feature value is high, it positively correlate that, that the relationship is positively correlated with the predicted value and so on. So you can kind of read out from one of these feature importances in a very sophisticated way, or take the absolute value of them if that's all you care about. You don't care about directionality. They have a bunch of other plots for you as well that I just wanted to show you so you know what they are. Um, as, as a, uh, in addition to this, you can now say, OK, let's extend that. So these are all the features. These are all the features. The diagonals are the same beast form I just showed you. But now these other things talk about how do the different features interact. So this is explicitly including pairwise, only pairwise, but still pairwise. And that's better than most do. And so then it'll give you an interaction dependency plot. This one is going to take just a little bit to fit in your brain. We're going to try. Here's one feature on the x-axis. The other feature is on the color axis. And the y-axis is how much they interact. And the reason why this is complicated is because this is in addition to what we already said they do individually. So in your head, you have to subtract that out somehow, that we've already covered that in the bee swarm plot. And this is extra stuff that's happening because they relate to each other in an interesting way. And actually, on this one, let's see if I can do this. When the sales is very high, the performance influence, influences your predicted value low. But as performance goes up, a high value of sales will positively influence your prediction. But that's in addition to whatever they were doing by themselves. So a little bit hard to understand. What it is nice, though, is that this can all be summarized up in this thing that looks like a correlation plot, but isn't. These are the importances on the diagonal that you would normally expect. And the others are essentially warning flags, high interaction here. Not necessarily you're going to pull from the graph exactly what that is, but at least you're aware of it. And I don't really know any other method that does that very well. So that's pretty cool. The other nice thing about this is it, it has been accelerated for many different models. So if you're using decision trees, random, uh, random forests, some kinds of DNNs, um, and actually a few more, they now have implementations that get into the guts of the model and don't quite do the whole black box wrapping nonsense. It's much, much faster. All right, so some pragmatic advice before we move on from this feature importance thing. Initially, you should do a survey for model complexity in a problem. You have your data sets, you understand the data for a while, and then you sweep many different complexities and you find out how complex of a model you really should be using. When you're doing that, keep in mind which ones are interpretable and which ones aren't. The second thing you should do is you should reduce that feature complexity in any way, shape, or form you possibly can. Use different kinds of feature importances. Use simple ones at first, but then what you're looking for is not what's important. You're looking for the things that guaranteed aren't important. None of the models ever pick these things. Just throw them out. Your problem just became simpler. You can move on and never look back. After you do that, it's time to actually do ablative feature removal. Because this is the only real guarantee that my model still works after I throw some of this stuff out. You have to ablate and then retrain. And then finally, at the end of it, you hyperparameter tune and get your final deliverable model that you want to give. And hopefully, you also carry it along an explainable, simple version that you can compare to that can be explaining it with you. So that's what I'm suggesting is a useful procedure. All right. Let's pause just for a minute. Are there any questions on the feature importance thing? Because we're about to move on to other topics. Sounds like feature sensitivity is how 
aren't doing good parameter evaluation and model performance is the values of the model. Yes. And feature importance is how does performance change when you whether or not you have certain Correct, and they and they are highly related. Um, it's almost like the integral over all the sensitivity should agree with the yeah the importance, yeah. But most methods don't give you sensitivity at all. That's extra. Yeah. It suggests it well. In the Shapley, yes, it does. It gives you a suggestion because you would need you would need to add those two together in some complex way to get their true interaction. And I'm not really sure if Shapley's going to do that for you. It splits those out and just leaves it to you now, saying, "Buyer beware! You have to look here to understand it a little more." Um, using Shapley for feature selection is different than just using it for understanding. And I would actually say that. We need to do more research to prove that it's the same thing as feature ablation methods for feature selection. Um, I would not be comfortable with saying I can definitively say what to throw out based on one of those plots. I use it more for understanding. Any others? OK. So now let's go back to a whole new kind of explanation. Which are the training so the, to the, my source of my data? Why did the model do what it did at all? And this is actually formal statistics now. We're going to go all the way back. They worked this out quite a long time ago. It's called influence functions, but there's mod modern implementations of it. And it was brought to ML again in that Cambrian explosion time. Um, but it's very, very simple. You could imagine just ablating different training examples and seeing how it affects your outcome. That is, in the end, the biggest acid test of it. That is computationally infeasible, but that is exactly what one would do if one, if one wanted to compute it in the formal way. Um, However, if you want to approximate it using traditional statistical methods, you would need access to explicit second derivative information. How does my model change if I add or remove a, um, a particular point? Because now I can predict it without a full retrain. And the modern papers that I link to up there, if you're interested to pursue it, have figured out how to approximate that second derivative with a second order optimization problem. So there are now sampling ways where you can get at some of what this was telling you from the beginning. So that's pretty spiffy. Um, and there's two versions of it. One is if we perturb a particular training's value up and down, how much does it mess with me? And one is if I perturb its weight, the extreme version is leave one out. Um, how does that influence my outcome? And we're not actually ever interested in that answer, right? We're never interested in a heat map of which, which particular training sets do what. What we're looking for are outliers or unexpected structure in this. Oh my god, my model only depends on four data points. Why is that? That would be very startling. Um, so influence functions are the formal way to do this, and you can compute them, uh, but for the most part, only for certain models, because we are approximating a second-order derivative, and that's only valid for certain kinds of models. Um, but there are some libraries that you can use. And now let's say, what, what is it actually for? We think it's for critically informative. That's what we think in our head, which are the ones that matter the most. It actually mostly comes up with what are the things that are hurting us the most, it can actually answer that question too. I remove this from my training set and my performance goes up. What's that about? Um, it, and once it identifies these particularly influential aspects, they could be insight into why it's making its predictions, the reason why you're here today in this class. It could also just be outliers that are so ridiculously influential that they showed up in this and maybe you want to know about that. It could be annotation errors. That's a very common one. They're always going to be in there. You will never have pure annotations. Um, and these also make beautiful targets for adversarial attacks. And that's what this example is. So this is a picture, by the you can't see that, but it's a dog with a fish, and then somebody thought it would be useful to label that as fish. And because, and, but this is a dog-fish classifier, so that was pretty adversarial. And they identified using this method. In this case, they're not saying leave it out. They're saying an arbitrary amount of noise added to this highly influential thing that said fish can now actually flip huge numbers of dogs to fish. So it, even, it wasn't itself immediately harmful and wasn't detected as necessarily a big problem. But with a tiny amount of noise injected in the system, you could actually tank the entire system by, by leveraging one of these important influential points. So that's why this stuff can matter. And actually, uh, adversarial people will use methods like this to find exactly what they should do. So if you're in one of those security settings, this is what you're up against, is they're analyzing your systems with this. Um, 
And then the last thing is when you have domain mismatch, your model stops working after it's been working for a while. You kind of want to know why that is. You can use this method possibly to say, well, that's because some of your training data is no longer actually relevant anymore. If you retrain on the new data, use this on the old one, it can say these, this data is completely useless or completely determinate. What, one of the things, and this is a hypothesis, the authors want to support this because they like their method, but they're saying that if you have a model that is highly determinate from a few examples, it is inherently brittle. I would argue that would depend on whether those are a good curriculum or a bad curriculum. But if it accidentally ended up that way, it's probably a bad curriculum because it was a statistical fluke. All right. But let's keep going. We have a few more things, and then we'll be done. So activation maps. This is one you see in the news all the time, and I have huge issues with it. It's very clever, but it isn't really complete. So identify where the classifiers are spatially looking. And that's how everybody says, oh my gosh, the deep learning system on the image is doing all these amazing things, spatial recognition and such. Look at what it can classify. I wonder where it's looking. And this is what you want to see. This is what it looks like when it's supposed to work. You start at the node at the very end, that means dog, and then you work your way back following the gradients, and that will eventually get you to the pixel space. And you make a heat map of those excitations, and you say that is where it's looking. Now that isn't the same thing as where a human would look. It's not attentional. But um, as you do that process, you can do positive gradients or negative gradients. And so now you can say, positively speaking, if you, if you had a dog detector, hopefully, if you, and it was saying, oh, I stared at the dog, you're like, awesome. If, it was look, if you then said, what are you not looking at, and it focused on the cat, you would feel even stronger that it's doing the right thing. So this is an ideal. It's very cherry picked. Um, and I will also say, um, before we move on, that you, you can do a fancier one than that. So Deep Dream, you've seen these surreal LSD kind of images coming out. And what they do is they'll take a dog detector and attach it to an embedded feature space that is like all Picasso drawings or something. And so now, when you're trying to go backwards to see what's going on, you take images and you perturb them until you get the thing that excites the dog detector the most that was also forced to go through the Picasso embedding, and you end up with a Picasso dog, right? Or whatever it is, right? You're, you're forcing it to get that strange fitting. I think that they saw that and went, wow, I got to put it on the internet. Nobody does anything really usefully with that. Um, but this is what actually happens when you make heat maps, is you train a person detector, and then you look at it, and you say, my person detector isn't looking at faces. This is an enormous problem. So it actually isn't very interpretable to look at these and say, what did it learn, and how is it making its decision, unless it does something totally wrong, at which point you really feel pretty powerfully that something is wrong. So it ends up being a debugging tool. Um, but even as a debugging tool, it can get very nervous. I would look at this and say, it looks like it made a hand detector to me, but you can feel free to disagree. And that's the problem. It's not interpretable. All right. Now let's take you into the modern age. I think this paper is pretty breathtaking, and I think it's a step of the future and where we actually need to go, which is why I wanted to show it to you. So this is now talking about a specific paper and approach, pretty cutting edge. It's called This Looks Like That. And so how do humans actually do this? When you go to an expert and say, this is a red belly finch, you get to ask why. And then stuff comes out of their mouth. What does that actually look like? So what they do is they say, well, this is the image you wanted me to classify. And in my head, there's these standard images that I have that I'm comparing it with. And this piece of evidence looks like that. This piece of evidence doesn't look like that. So actually, it might be that, but I'm not certain. This is what a human sounds like when they explain themselves. It's evidence-based. It's regional, region attentional focus, and it's comparison to what we're going to call prototypes. So if that's what humans sound like, and we're happy with those explanations, why not make an architecture that fundamentally builds this into itself from the beginning, rather than a post hoc process that tries to wrap it in the end and get back to it? And that's exactly what they did. It's a standard con a CNN type convolutional layers come together, but then there's this thing that they've shoved in the middle right before the classification layer in which they force it to articulate the problem by comparison to a set of prototypes. The prototypes are small tiles that are taken out of the original image because that's what it does. It's a tile-based detector. And they are in an embedded layer, an embedded setting. So it has learned the right embedding for the data based on the labeled data that you provided. So it is learning and embedding, just as normal. But it also is learning which prototypes do I keep in the classes. And the classes also are penalized in one other way. A prototype during the selection process 
should not be close to other classes and should be close to the ones within its class. So if you introduce those two constraints, it kind of encourages it to think that I don't want an arbitrary set and some of them are skillful. They all need to be skillful and they need to be different as well because I told you what I care about. So by constraining the problem in this way, you get a whole bunch of, of uh, additional benefits in performance. And this is kind of what it, how it goes. So we have an image that we want to analyze and we ran, you know, randomly tile all through it or sweep the tiles through. And it then starts comparing to the prototypes that it's developing right now. And eventually these are actually all linked back to the training example, so specific training examples. This has everything in it all at the same time. Which features matter, which training examples are influential, and region attention of focus of where I'm looking right now, all happening at the same time just because of the introduction of that layer. And I really want to drive this home in this next plot. So this is what an image would look like if you do a heat map attention area. There's a bird. I was looking at the bird. Cool, right? I'm glad you weren't looking at the bird. That would be disturbing. The next thing, these are attentional based methods, not yet what we're talking about here. I found the eye and the green part to be the most useful part of the bird. Okay, that's more comforting, I guess, but I don't really know what the right answer was. So I don't know how to interpret if that was useful or not, unless maybe I look at all the different ones and notice it always looks at the green one, then we can kind of reason maybe the green was important. This is what this method does. I saw a bird. These are the parts that were important because they looked like these parts in other images that I feel confident are representative of this class based on the data you showed me. And if you sum all this evidence together, I conclude this is my best explanation. That more sounds like a human. That's pretty cool. So this is what I would call a, well, it's an attempt at making deep glass boxes. They combine the power and expressibility of deep learning with the ability to pull them apart as easily as we pull apart a decision tree. And I think this is pretty brilliant. So consider methods like this, but this works for imagery. We don't have this for time series yet. We don't have this for a variety of data that we need it for. And when it isn't something as clear as a simple object that I'm trying to recognize, heat maps get really hard. Because in nature, when I'm looking down and saying, is it a geyser? There's no sharp edges. Everything blends. The right and wrong answers are unclear. And the interpretability becomes even, and the, explain, and the explanations become even more important and even harder to know if they're real. So we have, the normal we have the normal experience in the group of providing explanations to scientists, and they go, wow, I don't understand that. And that's either wonderful or useless, and I don't know how to tell the difference. That's what science data is like. So this is great, but it's a first step. We need to go even farther. OK, and that's it. So in quick summary, many ML models are interpretable. Use them. You should be forced off of them screaming and kicking when possible because they're so powerful if you can use them. Visualizing models when you can. But you'll only be able to do that with certain interpretable models. Usually you can't. But you can still do it for some of your important features. Interpretations still have to be transformed into explanations, but it's easy. A linear regression does not explain itself, but it doesn't take much thought to do it. Without interpretability, you're going to have to do something post hoc. And that is complicated, as you saw. And the different methods all do it to one degree or another. Surrogate models can approximate one. There are ways to do it that are simple. There's LIME, which is complex. May, and may, this one, you have to work with your users to figure out what kind of an explanation do you really want? Would this be helpful or not? In my case, LIME wasn't usually, but it could be for some people. Um, feature engineering always. It makes things more interpretable, more understandable. So it's a cheap way to get there. But selection and importance is always going to be part of this. There's lots of ways to do that, as you saw. Activation mops are not as cool as they seem. They're great to put on websites. They're great to like give to a news article. But if you want to really understand it, you need more than that. Um, this explosion that happened in the 2017 is still diffusing. Most people that do ML still don't know these methods very well. So it's percolating through. And we're still trying to figure out what they're good and bad for. You will define new ones by your needs. And if you have even a thought, I wonder if, Let's start experimenting, because we need better stuff than this so far. Um, and it almost seems like it's a little stalled right now. And the newest thrust, thrust, when you see XAI, what I'd like you to think about is making models that bake in the interpretability back that we got rid of. That's the right way. Ever increasing complexity of combinatorical black box processes around other black boxes, OK, we, we have supercomputers, and they're still not working very well. I'm not really sure that's the right way to go. 
how about we make it express itself in a way that humans like? And that's pretty much it. Thanks. There's lots of other things you could look at, by the way, as well. As soon as I showed this to my group, they were like, oh, this one, this one, this one. I was like, I'm so not talking about that. But um, here's all their different suggestions. And there's some really great websites that go through all this stuff. So thanks very much. Any final questions before we part? This is more about the mini ones, I guess. I'm, you know, I, I get how they're very inseparable. I'm trying to understand why they, would, they aren't very explainable. They don't give an explanation. If I give you a linear regression with 12 terms, you can tell me why it got its answer, but why are they set that way? What does it mean? You still don't really know like anything more than just some simple math. Right. I, I guess like, I mean, I would kind of say, well, because you derive the model in a whole, like, you know, you derive the computation of the parameters in a way that would lead to you know, about a squared law. And that is, that is a mathematical fact. But humans don't usually walk away and go, ah, and then now I understand more about my data. Okay. I don't understand anything like that. So in the sense of like, why did the data train in this way? Is that, is that a better? Here would be what I would call an explanation. Well, the, the, three, the following three terms in here had feature values that dominated this particular uh, prediction that I made. And the reason that those were dominating is there's actually three groups of data in, that, in their training set, and this is right on the edge of one of those examples where these three features are known to dominate. It is kind of, there's a suggestion of a subclass in that population, and that's why I said what I said. You know, it's a, you know, there are pink, blue, and yellow. This is kind of one of the pink ones, and for pink ones, these three features matter. As you can see here, that's kind of what a human would do if we explain it to somebody else. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Also, pick all this apart. What's wrong with it? What is it missing? Yeah. So that's a great question. Bias is a word that uh, data scientists kind of raise their hackles about a little bit because bias is also a measure of skill. It's the unwanted biases that we have to watch out for. So I would say you are engineering a bias, which hopefully you are bringing skill with. You are adding value. Um, but you're certainly biasing it toward that. However, if you introduce a suite of potential features to ask a question and allow the data to drive the selection from that, I would say you're freeing yourself a little bit from that introduction of bias. Um, if your features are very complex, then actually, yes, you might actually do a little project over here to show why this is a good feature, and you might need explainability for that again. That's a great question. Um, one of the big kind of developments in the blockchain world and this project world was this idea that if you ask an AI, like well, a language model or whatever, to explain itself and like answer the question, it will usually perform a lot better. Do like, like it will have higher accuracy or whatever. Do you see that sort of auto regressive way of doing things as kind of a future for explainability? Or do you think that's sort of like a red herring and these models can sort of like hallucinate fake explanations and give no answers to them? I have never failed, been failed to impress at how much hallucination is possible. Um, I would say that the problems that I deal with for science are very rarely autocomplete problems where you can just take something out, complete the series, okay, it's going to learn a manifold and all of it will be well. Um, I would say, however, that if you make an explainable system during the development time, the R&D part, it will be barfing all over the place with explanations that horrify everybody. So you'll find problems faster and make a higher quality system that you'll deliver. And once it's in the field, when problems start to happen, it will be helping you understand that. I think there is a certain bias there that will produce more positive outcomes so much that I don't know if I can decouple that from, no, the model's performing better because it's explaining itself. It might have been the humans were stimulated to do a better job because of that too. Um, but I haven't seen the exact results you're referring to, so I should look those over. Yeah. There's been a lot of research nowadays in like AI space, even if it's like outside of cars, like is the like people who space. Right. Since you mentioned they're like this is how like AI safety is one of the things that you hear about is like particularly where it's like I guess in that case, like, what is like the, the buzz that I'm looking for? There? Assurance. Okay. ML assurance is usually making a secondary system that ensures the first one didn't go insane. And if it did go insane, why did that happen? To make sure that the system on a whole always does something safe. 
And so I, I think you'll find more things. It's almost more of an ML ops concept because that's what self-driving is. It's, a, it's an ML ops experience. We know those self-driving cars aren't perfect. Nothing can be. So what do we do about that? And I'm not really sure we want to just have it say an excellent reason why it keeps crashing. That probably isn't quite satisfying, but that's all this stuff will ever do. Did that get at your question? Maybe I didn't understand. Okay. And the self-driving cars are fascinating because I really care about making systems that do say, this is what I did, this is why. Um, if you'd like to retrain me, here's some other things you need to know on how you could retrain me. Like They're helping the user understand what's going on and even fix it or change it. And this is never what you want in a self-driving car. At the, you never want a self-driving car to stop for a minute and say, how have I been doing and how could I do better? Right? You just don't want that. Um, that's an engineering situation and it's a risk reduction situation. So the systems I'm making would be horrible cars because they'd be constantly asking for feedback and they'd be constantly varying things to see if they could drive a little better on mud or something. Um, great during R&D, not so great in the field. This is also why uh, industry is not driving this stuff. That's why it's not as advanced as gigantic models with lots of CPUs and the other things that industry likes to invest in. Any other thoughts? These are great questions. Okay, thanks.